All right, well, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Kurt Asher, I'm Dean of the Library, and um, I wanted to welcome all of you and, to, and uh, tonight's panelists. Um, welcome to Marijuana Policy in Kern County and Community Conversation. We were gonna call it a joint conversation, but we can't. <laughs> <laughs> Too much on the nose. Um, we're grateful to be working with Michael Burroughs and the Kegley Institute of Ethics tonight, uh, which they play such a vital role in our community. Um, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, you know, all the work you've done putting this event together. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank the Kegley sponsors and to publicly acknowledge some of the people who uh, made this event possible. Our promotion and events team, in addition to their many other duties in the library, always work tirelessly to make our events successful. Thanks to Teresita Overden, Eileen Montoya, <coughs> Kathy Driscoll, and Frank Aguirre for uh, leading the logistics and promotions and helping with the organization of this event. Finally, I'd like to offer a special thanks to Kern Behavioral Health and uh, Recovery Services for their involvement in this event. We're looking forward to an important and energetic debate tonight or discussion. Um, and now I'd like to turn, over the, the, turn the floor over to Dr. Michael Burroughs, Assistant Professor of Philosophy, Director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, and the moderator and organizer of tonight's event. Good evening, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, on behalf of the Kegley Institute of Ethics and the Walter Stern Library, uh, welcome to all of you. And it's great to be with all of you tonight. It's really wonderful to have a full room and to see all of you here. So um, I want to say thank you, too, to, to Dean Asher uh, for his opening remarks and to him and his team uh, for their collaboration in organizing this important event. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. And I want to take a moment to express a few more words of appreciation as well. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Ms. Rashima Dean uh, for her assistance with event logistics. Um, and a, a big thanks to Emily Poole, uh, Director of Campus Programming, and our student volunteers. Our, our, if our student volunteers are in the room, if they can raise their hand. I guess they're not in the room, but they are, <laughs> they, they are in the building. Um, so thank you to them for all of their help tonight. Um, Thank you also to our sponsors who make this and, and all Kegley Institute of Ethics events free and open to the public. Uh, this is the Kegley family, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Kaiser Permanente, and Adventist Health Bakersfield. So a big thanks goes to them for making this possible. So uh, before introducing our panelists, I, I want to note just briefly uh, the inspiration for this program, which we've titled Marijuana Policy in Kern County, a Community Conversation. So like any community, we face challenges and difficult decisions in policy and in practice about which there is reasonable disagreement and that re still require decisions of us as a community nonetheless in the face of that disagreement. So questions of marijuana policy, legalization, and access are requiring decisions literally of us right now, uh, both locally where Bakersfield City and Kern County voters will soon determine the availability of medical and recreational cannabis in Kern County and also nationally, you know, across our country. So the Kegley Institute of Ethics and, and the Walter Stern Library are, are committed to providing a forum for respectful and civil discussion about these issues. We refer to this as an opportunity for community conversation, and that's an intentional use of that term. So even or especially in disagreement, even in differences of orientation and in background, we can come together as a community to share our views civilly and for the common good. That is the primary motivation for hosting this event and the reason that we put in the work to bringing this together. And I look forward to engaging with you in this conversation tonight. Now to help us in this conversation, we're providing an expert panel who will offer diverse perspectives relating to marijuana policy and its impacts. Now, following these brief presentations, each panelist is gonna speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. We'll have ample time for questions and discussion from all of you. So to that end, uh, you'll notice a microphone on this side of the room and on this side of the room. You can uh, get in line and ask questions that way, you know, verbally. But also our uh, fantastic student volunteers, I think have handed out no cards to everybody. 
Um, you can write a question down on that, and those will be collected at the end, and I will go through that as a mailbag and pick some out. So if you don't feel, if you feel a little shy tonight, you can ask a question that way, that's fine too. So now to uh, our panelists. I'll give them a brief introduction before they start with their comments. So first we have Professor Dirk Horn. Uh, Dirk Horn is a lecturer in the political science department at California State University, Bakersfield, and a PhD candidate at the University of California, Irvine. Dirk's research interests include US foreign policy, Latin American political economy, medical marijuana policies in the US, and international drug control policies. His current work focuses on drug control policies in Latin America, with particular attention being paid to how Latin American countries and drug cartels are responding to marijuana legalization in the US. Next we have Ms. Ana Overa. Ms. Overa is the System Administrator for the Substance Use Disorder Division of the Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Department. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and has been involved in outpatient substance use and mental health treatment since 2006. In that role, she has worked with adults, adolescents, pregnant mothers, and those involved with the criminal justice and child welfare systems. She has also provided training for the Kern County Network for Children, Kern Medical's uh, Psychiatry Residency Program, and the Kern County Public Health Department. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Josh Meisel. So Josh is Professor of Sociology and Co-Director of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research at Humboldt State University. Based in a bioregion well known for cannabis cultivation, Dr. Meisel's prior research examined visual representations of the local cannabis industry, student employment and cannabis related jobs, and news media coverage of cannabis issues. His current research is concerned with reducing harms associated with cannabis edibles and the relationship between cannabis and tobacco use. Dr. Meisel is co-author with Dr. Dominic Corva of the Rutledge Handbook of Interdisciplinary Cannabis Research. So please join me in welcoming uh, our panelists. Uh, I want to note, too, um, uh, just two other final details. So there is an additional, given the, the turnout, an additional overflow room, uh, room 202 on the second floor is now also open. If you would like a seat, there is seating there, and it will be streaming. Uh, and this event is also being live streamed, um, so we say hello to all those watching us digitally um, and our friends from afar right now. So thank you for joining us that way. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our first uh, speaker, our first panelist tonight. And that's going to be Professor Dirk Horn. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you for coming out on this Thursday evening. I hope we can have a good conversation and the audience can get some information from my fellow panelists and we can have a good conversation after we've all presented. Uh, my name is Dirk Horn. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science here at CSUB. And today I'll be talking about legal marijuana in California generally, but legal marijuana in, in Kern County more specifically. <clears throat> well, to understand where we are today with, in regards to legal marijuana, we have to understand how we got here. Uh, in 1996, Californians pro uh, passed Proposition 215 with 56% of the vote, and Prop 215 allowed for the um, medical use of marijuana uh, for qualified medical patients. Um, it also established a collective, profit collective dispensary clause in Proposition 215 to allow uh, companies to open up uh, dispensaries in order to provide medication uh, to Californians. Um, much like we will see with Proposition 64 today, many counties and cities across the state uh, banned storefront medical marijuana dispensaries, uh, and there was many, many challenges from the federal government, uh, as well as raids by DEA uh, officials uh, in many parts of the state, most often usually during uh, in the early part of 2000, during, uh, in areas that were allowing uh, marijuana dispensaries to operate. Um, 
These legal challenges continued during uh, George uh, W. Bush's administration, and many marijuana advocates were hopeful when President Obama got elected that raids would stop. Uh, he had campaigned on allowing states that have medical marijuana policies to dictate how those are enforced. So many activists were happy uh, that he won the election. Uh, much to their dismay, uh, raids and legal actions continued under the Obama administration. Uh, and uh, under the Obama administration, there were actually more raids conducted than under the Bush administration. Uh, many of these raids were at the behest of local officials uh, who requested federal help to shut down uh, illegal marijuana dispensaries, uh, but raids continued. Um, in 2016, California's prop passed Prop 64, the Adult Use of Marijuana uh, Act, with 57% of the vote. Uh, this act allowed people 21 or older to possess an ounce of marijuana, eight grams of cannabis concentrate, and up to six live mature plants. Uh, the act also created the Bureau of Cannabis Control that is funded by the excise taxes on legal marijuana. And much like Prop 215, Prop 64 allows for localities to impose stricter limits on the consumption and distribution of marijuana within the region. Um, and as we can see here that there are many areas, especially within uh, the Central Valley, that medical and marijuana, uh, medical marijuana as well as recreational marijuana access has been restricted. Um, there are very little legal marijuana dispensaries in Kern County. I'm sure many of you in the audience have uh, visited some of our less legal dispensaries in the county and city, but there are no legal dispensaries in much of the Central Valley. This lack of access has allowed the black market to thrive in California, uh, and not only because there is a lack of access in many parts of the state, but because there are heavy burdensome regulations put on the production, the distribution, and the sale of marijuana that has imposed uh, high uh, fees and taxes that have increased the cost of legal marijuana compared to illicit marijuana. Um, these high taxes are not only on marijuana dispensary owners, they are on consumers as well, with 15% excise tax having to be applied to all marijuana purchases, regardless of its recreational or medicinal, uh, sales tax being applied as well, and any additional county or city taxes on the sale of marijuana. Uh, after these taxes are imposed, marijuana, the, pro the price of legal marijuana ends up going about 40% more than the price of illicit black market marijuana. Kern County and Bakersfield have had a long history and, and uh, contentious history with marijuana in the region. Bakersfield has banned marijuana dispensaries, medical marijuana dispensaries, since 2004. It again took up the issue in 2013, passed another ban, and just recently passed the ban in 2017 and in anticipation for the recreational marijuana rollout in January of 2018. Kern County has had just as a contentious history. Uh, they first banned uh, medical marijuana dispensaries in 2011 after there was a proliferation of dispensaries throughout the state and the county. This is due to SB 420 that was passed uh, in the early 2000s that codified the right of dispensaries to exist, meaning that they were legally allowed to exist under Prop 215, and this allowed many dispensaries to proliferate around the state, and Kern County was no different. Kern County uh, supervisors wanted to act, so they uh, enacted a ban in 2011. Later that year, uh, citizen petition uh, overturned the ban and suspended it while the issue was still going to be uh, litigated. And in 2012, supervisors wanting to move away from the issue, they repealed the ban and placed Measure G on the ballot for the citizens of Kern County uh, to vote. Measure G passed with 69% of the vote, and it uh, required medical marijuana dispensaries to operate in industrial parts of Kern County. Uh, Measure G ended up being ruled invalid in 2014 due, due to a technicality. Uh, the county did not order a environmental impact report before putting the measure on the ballot, which met, made, violated California law. Therefore, Measure G was ruled invalid. Um, the ruling that Measure G was knocked down created much confusion in Kern County. The county thought that that knocking down of Measure G meant that medical marijuana dispensaries in the county were again banned. While county uh, marijuana dispensary owners believed that, well, now there are no restrictions on mar marijuana dispensaries. So there was a lot of amb ambiguity in the law, and that was the ambiguity that we were dealing with up until 2017 when the county supervisors passed a new ban on recreational and medical marijuana, um, but uh, they allowed the existing dispensaries to stay in operation until January of 2019. The cost of prohibition in Kern County is 
is quite costly. It is quite costly uh, to, to have the ban intact and not allow medical marijuana or recreational marijuana dispensaries in Kern County is going to cost the taxpayers between 1.2 and $2.7 million a year. On the other hand, if we allow dispensaries to operate within the county and we regulate them and tax them, we have the opportunity to net upwards of $30 million a year and create 9,000 full-time jobs. Right. This is all in the backs of the county asking its citizens to uh, vote for a tax increase as well as the city. Right? This revenue stream has caught the eye of some cities in Kern County and not all cities in Kern County have followed the prohibitive path that Kern County and Bakersfield have uh, enacted. Arvin is a good example of a city that has fully embraced recreational and medical marijuana, uh, facing huge sh budget shortfalls. Uh, Arvin City Council uh, uh, voted to allow the commercial production, manufacturing, distribution, and testing of both recreational and medical marijuana in the city. Arvin does not allow marijuana sales, either recreational or medical in the city, but they are looking into whether they should allow delivery service. Essentially, Arvin wants to be uh, a, a hub of marijuana production and have that marijuana that's produced in Arvin be shipped to other larger sectors within the state. Uh, California City went the other way. They do not allow any recreational marijuana activity in the city at all, but they fully embrace medical marijuana by allowing manufacturing, production, and the sale of marijuana, uh, medical marijuana in the city. So not all cities in Kern County have followed the path of Bakersfield and the county. Luckily, Kern County citizens have a couple different measures in front of them this November to allow them to have access to either medical or recreational marijuana. The city, uh, people who live in the city of Bakersfield uh, will see an uh, initiative as well. Uh, so I'll be discussing those three initiatives to give you some more information to help you inform your vote in November. Measure J is a county initiative and it lists the ban on medical marijuana dispensaries in unincorporated parts of Kern County. A, the ban on recreational marijuana dispensaries remains intact, and there are some zoning uh, requirements for dispensaries and other business, marijuana businesses to operate. Uh, they must be 600 feet away from a school, uh, they have to be 1,000 feet away from each other, and uh, the, the authors of Measure J wanted to take much of the local politics out of uh, this measure and have Kern County follow the state guidelines as far as zoning and background checks and hours of operation. Uh, there's been too much controversy in their eyes uh, surrounding this issue locally, so they wanted to take the power out of local government and just have uh, Kern County follow the state guidelines. Uh, Measure J applies a 7.5% uh, sales tax on all dispensary and other marijuana business profits, and all the money that is generated from that tax goes into the county's general fund, meaning they can spend that money as they see fit. Measure K uh, is also a county measure, but Measure K allows both recreational and medical marijuana in, in Kern County. Uh, measure K requires that the cultivation, processing, and distribution businesses be located in two industrial zones out off of I-5. One north of Bakersfield off of I-5 and Highway 58, and one south of Bakersfield off of I-5 and Copus Road. Um, both recreational and medical dispensaries, though, would be allowed to operate in all in unincorporated parts of the county. They would not be restricted to those industrial zones out to I-5. Uh, measure K limits the, the number of dispensaries to number thir to 35, and they have some zoning requirements as well, such as have to be a thousand feet away from the school, and they have to be so many feet away from each other as well. Um, measure K includes a grandfather clause that allows dispensaries that were in operation prior to May 10th, 2016 to stay in operation for two years after Measure K takes effect in order to th for them to uh, transition into the new framework and move if they need to or update their building code or comply with the zoning and the requirements in Measure K. So it doesn't shutter all the uh, dispensaries that are open now. Uh, Measure K imposes a 5% tax on dispensaries and other marijuana businesses and they earmark some of the revenue unlike Measure J. 65% would go into the general fund, meaning the county could spend it as they wish. 20% would be earmarked for public safety, mainly law enforcement, and 15% would be earmarked uh, to mitigate the side effects of drug use in the county. So it has some earmarks in there, um, much different than Measure J. 
Measure O, on the other hand, is the initiative that deals with the city of Bakersfield. Measure O is very similar to Measure J. Um, it has some of the same influence as far as, as, far as crafting the policy. Uh, Measure O lifts the ban on uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, but the ban on recreational dispensaries stays intact. Uh, Measure O creates a set of a permitting process for medical marijuana businesses within the city. Uh, applicants will have to pay a fee, uh, but that fee is minimal and it's not to exceed the cost of processing the application. Um, there's some dispute among the authors of Measure O and the city attorney. Um, the city attorney has read the text of the measure and they believe that uh, Measure O does not provide for any provisions for the revocation or suspension of city permits to marijuana businesses. Meaning if a marijuana business gets a permit legally from the city and they're found either to be operating in violation of Measure O, in violation of county zoning standards, or in violation of state law, that the city would be unable to revoke their marijuana uh, business license. Uh, the authors of Measure O, uh, they counter that and say that's not the case. But as the city attorney is the one going to be interpreting this statute, uh, it would be better to err on the side of judgment. Right. Much like the other measures, there's some zoning requirements for Measure O, 1,000 feet from schools, 1,000 feet from each other, um, and they're allowed in all commercial light manufacturing and general manufacturing zones. Uh, measure O applies a 7.5% sales tax on the profits of dispensaries and other medical uh, marijuana businesses, and all tax re revenue is set to go into the city's general fund, much like Measure J. Well, um, all these measures have some flaws. I'm sure that you've picked some out in this brief description. I picked them out reading through the text of uh, each measure. And these, uh, these measures are allowed to have flaws because it, it comes down to the fact that the county and the city of Bakersfield have essentially advocated their role in writing the regulations for an industry. They are allowing industry leaders, people involved in the industry, to write the regulations for that industry. You have to look long and hard to find other industries in America that are like that. It is the government's responsibility to write these type of regulations. Um, some of the clauses in these measures are unclear as well. Uh, a couple of these measures, it is unclear if you can amend the measure, meaning if these measures are rolled out and approved and they're going well, but something in the measure is not uh, going according to plan, it's not clear if the Board of Supervisors can amend these measures by vote or if it has to go back to the people, which that is very chaotic. Imagine for your business, imagine for patients, imagine for law enforcement, uh, not knowing how the city and the county are interacting with the marijuana businesses. Um, a couple individual criticisms of these measures. Um, Measure J uh, doesn't have uh, discretionary issues of permits. That means that they might not be able to deny permits to marijuana businesses that uh, fall within the state's uh, zone of operations, but maybe they don't fit well with California, or with Kern County, rather. Right? Um, it essentially takes the local politics out of it. That was the intention of the authors of Me Measure J. There's been too much controversy with ca uh, marijuana in Kern County and in Bakersfield, so they wanted to take that out of uh, the issue and just defer to the state, right? But if you defer to the state wholly, you might come up with some businesses that might not be a good fit, right? Measure K that creates the industrial zones off of I-5. The permitting process for these 35 dispensaries is unknown. How are these 35 dispensaries going to be chosen? Who chooses them, right? Who owns the land out there off of I-5? Is it the county land? Is it farmland? Who owns it? How much is it gonna cost, right? And that land out there, is it developed? Do we have to basically build infrastructure from scratch? Or can we use infrastructure that is already existent in Kern County, right? Lastly, Measure O is very ambiguous about the city's ability to suspend permits, right? Uh, if the city uh, attorney is saying that the city does not have the power, uh, and the authors of the measure are saying that the city does, that is inevitably gonna lead to a court case which will inevitably cost the city more money, right? So these measures are not perfect, right? But these, uh, this is not the fault of the authors of these measures uh, or of Prop 64. It is the fault of the Board of Supervisors and the City of Bakersfield for not taking the lead on regulating. You can't put your head in the sand and expect this issue to go away. Legal marijuana is here to stay. It is not going to go anywhere. Thanks so much, Professor Horn. Uh, next we have uh, Ms. Anna Overa.
Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so before I get started, I just want to reiterate that as a member of a county department, um, I'm here to represent this department, and we do not take a position on legalization or any of the measures that were just presented. I'm simply here tonight to talk to you a little bit about what our agency does and um, to talk a little bit about what we see in our delivery of services and what we see as the potential impacts um, that legalization will have in the, in the community and the people that we serve. Um, okay, so first off, to, to start um, with some context, uh, Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services um, serves as the health plan for specialty mental health and substance use disorder treatment services in Kern, and we serve the population that has Medi-Cal as their insurance plan and anybody that is uninsured. Um, we provide specialty mental health treatment for the severely mentally ill. We provide crisis services, um, substance use disorder treatment services, as well as prevention services, and that's prevention for both um, mental health concerns as well as su uh, substance abuse. Um, part of our department's goal is to really help us focus the resources we have to strategically provide the best quality of services that we have uh, for our community. And as uh, the manager for the Substance Use Disorder Division, it is part of my responsibility to bring forth a couple of objectives in that three-year strategic plan. One of them is to create a continuum of care that provides um, comprehensive substance use disorder treatment ranging from prevention um, all the way through outpatient, intensive outpatient, and residential care for those that um, have a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Um, another one of my objectives in the strategic plan is to develop uh, effective prevention strategies to address the issues that are facing our community like the opioid crisis but also legalization um, of, of marijuana here in Kern. Okay, good. And so what I'm gonna cover is how our department sees the impacts of, um, of legalization in, in our county. So I'll talk a little bit about how we see this movement forward with legalization in terms of youth. So we know that, um, you've probably heard that uh, prevention, wait, how does it go? An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. Um, and that's really our stance is that if we can prevent children from beginning their uh, use of any substance, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, or any others, that in the long run it'll be better because they will not need our services, uh, which are uh, unfortunately costly and they're limited here in our community. So one of the uh, main risks that we see in terms of legalization and commercialization is that uh, once um, any one of these measures uh, passes or not, we will then have a lot more exposure to cannabis within our community. Much like you see advertising for alcohol um, and tobacco, uh, cannabis will be the same. So the, the effect that this can have on youth is that as they perceive that as a normal part of their environment, it will decrease the perception of harm. And what the research indicates is that the, there's an inverse relationship between perception of harm and actual use. So surveys that are done on high school students show that the um, lower perception of harm, the more likely they are to report using cannabis um, in the last 30 days. These are you know, young, young children that they're doing this. Um, another thing that we see from um, potential impacts are the fact that if children start using marijuana before age 18, in the future, it has the potential to affect their academic achievement and achievement after um, they leave school. So their employment may not be as high as it could have been. Now that's sometimes a reach because we don't know what could have been, um, but it does have uh, potential implications. Another potential risk that we see for youth is for very young children, and if um, their parents have access to um, cannabis products, they may not be secured in a way that's safe, and so children may have access to these products and accidentally ingest them. And now, the, da the data that we've been looking at in terms of prevention science, um, it forces us to look at states that already have had legalization, like um, Colorado and Washington, and so some of the data reported from um, High impact drug trafficking area reports indicates that there's been a spike in calls to 
poison control centers um, for young children between ages zero to five. And, um, and, and these are comparison between um, prior to legalization, commercialization, and afterwards. So we see that as a, as a potential concern here. Okay, so in terms of um, cannabis, cannabis has uh, high potential for abuse, and that could lead to, in the future, a problem use and eventually a, a use disorder or addiction. Now that's not to say that everybody that uses marijuana will develop an opioid use disorder, um, but it increases their risk. And in terms of um, achievement and just overall well-being and health, the more that you can reduce your risks as an individual, the better off your outcomes will be in the long term. Um, one of the things that comes with addiction is that um, when somebody starts experimenting with drug or alcohol use, they may have higher risk because of a family history of addiction, um, but it also has to do with their, their physiology, their brain chemistry. So people, before they start experimenting, don't really know whether drug use will actually trigger um, a problematic pattern of compulsive use, which can then lead to problems in the long run. Uh, some people that we work with um, and, and are treated, they say that for some, they knew that they were addicted the minute they used one substance. And that's because different substances have different um, actions in the brain. Um, methamphetamine, for example, very different from cannabis or opioids. Um, but other people can say, that they've tried a certain drug and it was not difficult for them to leave it. So that kind of speaks to how um, their brain reacted to that exposure. Um, in terms of uh, continued use of marijuana, for those that have heavy use, it puts them at higher risk of um, presenting with psychotic symptoms or triggering a psychotic event. And the, that's for individuals who have a history of mental illness in their family. Um, and again, this is for heavy use. Again, that's not to say that anybody that smokes marijuana or uses cannabis will develop a psychotic disorder, but again, their, ris their risk might be increased. Um, another element we see as a risk is that as uh, legalization it becomes and commercialization becomes more widespread, more adults will have access to utilizing cannabis and its products. And we, in terms of prevention, we look at how that's going to affect children of parents who regularly use cannabis. So uh, research indicates that about um, a pretty high percentage, about 72% of the kids that were surveyed by the Betty Ford or Hazelland Betty Ford Foundation reported that their parents use marijuana and they reported use as well. So it's, that's one of the messages that we like to emphasize in terms of prevention is that it's an adult's behavior will really influence um, what young people's behavior um, turns out to be. And in terms of um, impacts on health in general, well, we know that smoking is harmful to the lungs. It uh, reduces blood flow. Um, it, well, you can't breathe, uh, or it's difficult to breathe. Um, so there's a lot of adverse effects due to um, ingesting cannabis in this way. I already mentioned the risk of poisoning. Um, in other states, they've seen this uh, because of edibles and just the inability to control for and calibrate for the potency of um, the THC content in these products. So people may eat an, an edible, not feel the effects right away, and they will eat more in hopes of feeling the effects. And by the time that those effects um, come to fruition, they become very, very uncomfortable. Uh, and they may end up in the emergency room with a really uncomfortable reaction. Uh, we also know that um, cannabis use can lead to changes in the brain. Um, and this is, many substances act in this way, but in, in terms of um, the adolescent brain, we know that the brain takes um, a long time to develop. The brain doesn't fully develop until about age 25. So the longer that a young person can delay any substance use, the better for brain health. Um, and it's not that um, cannabis will make, um, will affect a certain part of the brain, but it can definitely interfere with memory, attention, um, cognition, and focus. Okay, in terms of um, continued use, other states have seen an increase 
in use by pregnant women and women of childbearing age, which, which puts them and their fetus at risk for um, neural uh, development problems and low birth weight. Um, just like with smoking tobacco, low birth weight leads to a host of other health concerns later in life. And, um, and we, other states sees, um, see increases in, in the pregnant women utilizing cannabis. Uh, I just mentioned that it, cannabis use interferes with learning, memory, and attention. And some research indicates that these effects are short term, um, but others, as they become more longitudinal, longitudinal, excuse me, they're finding that these effects are not necessarily um, uh, going away as time passes and continue with continued use. Okay, so um, Dirk talked a little bit about uh, the impacts on safety in our communities. And again, one of the concerns here in Kern County that it's, it's pretty um, significant in my realm is the amount of um, DUI arrests and fatalities here in Kern. And so we see this as a, a, another potential risk. So the more that people use cannabis recreationally, the more likely that DUI fatalities uh, involving THC will increase which um, is concerning because it may put um, all of us in danger um, in the roadway. Um, okay, um, other states like Colorado have seen that um, there may be an increase in illegal activity that's related to marijuana production and that's because of um, maybe troublesome regulation that black market operations are not able to be integrated into the um, the market, but continue to operate, which can then lead to, um, in, in Colorado they reported an, an increase in the number of THC extraction labs. So these are operations where they extract the THC from um, cannabis with butane, which is highly flammable. And this leads to accidents, um, which then leads to uh, deaths and you know, affects the community that way. Mm. Other reports from, um, from Colorado indicate that if, that there's been an increase in things like burglaries and robberies in locations where others might think there's a lot of marijuana laying around or cash laying around associated with the production and distribution of marijuana. Um, and businesses that distribute marijuana may be at risk of this kind of vandalism and crime against their property. So they, um, again, they report a lot of break-ins, a lot of um, burglaries, um, crime increased around the area of the dispensary. And so it's, it's interesting to hear the, the measures and the setbacks that they have included. And that's kind of to protect against that, those kinds of um, concerns uh, around sensitive areas like schools, child care centers, treatment centers, churches, that kind of thing. All right. Um, Diversion of marijuana is also a concern. So even though there is um, rule against uh, young people utilizing it, um, the states that have it in place report that a lot of um, arrests uh, are of young people ages 12 to 17 having marijuana on their person, and they report that they obtain it from a friend or family member that obtained it legally. So even if, um, if it's done it through the appropriate channels, it still finds its way into the hands of young people. Um, and another interesting thing they found in Colorado and Washington is that uh, the U.S. Postal Service continues to uh, find packages of marijuana that's produced and then shipped to other states that do not allow for recreational use. Um, okay, so uh, I hate to be the party pooper and talk about all the bad stuff uh, in terms of rec uh, legalization, but some of the things that we're looking at in terms of solutions is, like I mentioned earlier, prevention is a really key um, effort in this regard. And in order to um, begin that, I think this is a really great forum to increase the kind of education around cannabis in risks and potential benefits and that kind of thing. Um, it's important as um, young adults and adults to really allow young people to express um, their concerns with cannabis and maintain open lines of communication. And um, for the parents in the room, like myself, set um, realistic and um, clear expectations whether you will allow or will not allow drug use in your home and for your children. Um, sometimes those kinds of um, lines are not set very clearly, 
So children will uh, listen to their friends and begin engaging in high-risk behaviors in that way. Um, and also, um, another thing that's important is to really consider whether a recreational use of marijuana has um, crossed the line into problematic use because it's, it's really important to notice whether this use has turned into something that interferes with life. If, um, as an individual, I would, I would uh, encourage everyone to consider whether um, use of cannabis, whether it's recreational or medicinal, has created problems in relationships, in employment, in, um, in social situations that really affect um, your own functioning. Um, and if that's the case, I encourage you to, to seek treatment and to reach out and talk to your health healthcare providers to look for solutions to something that may be a problem that was unexpected. So that's all I have. And now we have Dr. Josh Meisel. Thank you very much. Um, I, I should actually clarify, I'm, I'm a Meisel. The Meisels are down in Santa Barbara. Okay. We hadn't conversed on how to correctly pronounce a really difficult name. Um, so that's important. Also, just another clar clarification, if I may, because I don't want to give the false impression. I am working with my co-editor, Dr. Dominic Corva, on a handbook of interdisciplinary cannab cannabis research for Routledge Press. It's not out. But if you wait a few years, it will be. Well, not a few. <laughs> Hopefully 2020, 20. Yeah, we have contributions coming in in April. I'm, gonna, I'm, a, I'm a shorter uh, speaker, so I gotta bring this down here a moment. So let me pull up my slides here. I'm a Mac kind of guy, so bear with me. That looks like the one that says, and now you can see my notes. Um, is that looking all right? I can't see. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just want to get a uh, timer going here. I've got two hours. <laughs> so, uh, good evening. My name is Josh Mizell. I am a professor of sociology. I'm also a co-director of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research. I want to thank uh, Michael and the Kegley Institute on Ethics for, uh, for bringing me down to Bakersfield um, to have an opportunity to participate in a, I think, a very important conversation about uh, legalization and uh, cannabis effects. It's just super important. I think it's, uh, yeah, I did get, I did advance. Okay, good. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize that human relationships, uh, excuse me, I'm trying to get my timer on, bear with me, it's technology, okay. I think it's really important that we recognize that human relationships with, uh, with cannabis and questions about its con consumption represent only a very small blip in the history of time, in, in time. While cannabis is a plant, evolved 37 million years ago. I'm not sure if you can read that in the slide. It was only about 3000 BCE that there was evidence of its use and it was probably used as medicine. But our concern with its consumption and the development of prohibitions against its cultivation and its use only emerged about 100 years ago. So for a very long time we weren't too concerned about it. Now fast forward to the current cannabis moment and we find constantly evolving regulatory landscapes as it looks like Kern County and Bakersfield are, are dealing with. And there's increasing political pressure to reclassify cannabis and revisit international cannabis regulations. Of course, public opinion favoring legalization is helping to shape regulatory landscapes. Not sure if you could see this in the, uh, in the line graph up there, but recent polling data just uh, earlier this month shows 62% nationally support legalization compared to only about 30% just 
just ten, 10 years ago. The current cannabis moment, we could say, is then characterized as a time when most states and the District of Columbia have decriminalized or legalized cannabis. We also find, find ourselves living in a time when there's a radically convicting, con, excuse me, I, I jumped ahead here. The current cannabis moment is also characterized by the emergence of what we might call big canna, in which corporate interests are pumping in some cases, billions of dollars into the cannabis industry. Some of you may know that yesterday, Canada became the second country to legalize, to go legal with, with cannabis. Uh, the interest Constellation Brands that owns Corona Beer pumped a little over $4 billion into canopy growth uh, in August, making it the largest cannabis interest in the world. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of money that's shaping this as, uh, as Dirk brought up in, in the context of, of thinking about even who's at the table, who's writing the laws, who's, who's writing the regulations. And that's super important to consider. We also find ourselves living in a time when there are radically conflicting views on the public health, health impacts of cannabis. At one extreme is what I call the cannabis will save the world camp, <laughs> who believe that cannabis is a panacea for all that ails the world from cancer to climate change. <laughs> and at the other extreme are the prohibitionists who hold on to the 1930s reefer madness rhetoric of cannabis as poison. So the challenge lies for all of us, right, is trying to, trying to separate the horse manure from mis you know, reality. Because um, there is a lot of wild claims out there. I always like to talk about the wonderful film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and the uncle who had the window spray that had this amazing panacea-like effect. Um, so it's important to put things in perspective. Now, meanwhile, it is clear from, from the historical record that even in the present moment, attitudes and policy about cannabis have been driven largely by attitudes about particular users. The history of drug control in the United States has been more about controlling particular groups of people, defined, for example, by their race ethnicity, by their youthfulness, by their political affiliations, their nationality, than by particular forms of drug use. Now, these are just a, a range of quotes from, uh, I would say, drug warriors from the past uh, 100 or so years up till the present moment. This is reflected in the staggering, staggering number of people who are arrested for simple possession of cannabis. And so you could see in the last uh, little blip there, you probably just see a, a black smudge and a red vertical line, but it's about, what is it, about 500 some odd thousand people arrested in 2016 for simple possession. But as you know, or we know, or hopefully you know, that cannabis arrests have disproportionately impacted communities of color where blacks are almost four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis possession, even though rates of use are similar to those of whites. We've actually seen an increase after legalization in the state of Colorado in the, number, in the arrest rate of black and Latino youth for simple possession. Wow. So it's important to recognize the historic, political, social, and economic forces have rendered cannabis as having meaning and significance well beyond its botanical properties or any observed psychopharmacological effects. Cannabis is no longer just a plant. So let's turn to what we do know from the research examining the effects of legalization. In a nutshell, the research actually shows very mixed results. Research examining the impact of medical marijuana laws on adolescent use rates, treatment admissions, and the perceived harmfulness of the drug, which um, Anna spoke about, produced inconclusive results. Several studies have found no significant change in adolescent cannabis use rates pre and post passage of medical marijuana laws. One study observed that, quote, in general, medical marijuana law policies either have no impact on recreational marijuana use or are associated with reduced marijuana consumption. That same study 
found fewer cannabis treatment admissions in medical marijuana law, law states compared to non-medical marijuana law states. Oops. Another study actually found that perceived harmfulness increased. Let me say that again. Another study actually found that perceived harmfulness increased and use decreased amongst eighth graders in medical marijuana law states. Research examining the impact of recreational marijuana laws is also inconclusive. One study in Washington found perceived harmfulness decreased and use increased amongst eighth and tenth graders, while in Colorado it didn't. Amongst, tw amongst twelfth graders in both Washington and Colorado, there's been a s no significant change in perceived harmfulness and use. Another study in Oregon found that use increased only among youth who were already using, and still yet another study in Oregon found an increase only in sporadic use, and interestingly, oh, you're not even seeing the slide I thought you were looking at. I'm sorry. And <laughs> now I gotta start over. <laughs> interestingly, decreases in tobacco use among college students. Okay, so now I can go to the next slide. So now let's turn to what we know from recent reviews examining cannabis effects. Now thankfully, the, uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine released a comprehensive review last year on the research published since January 1 of 1999. They reviewed over 10,000 studies, and they examined cannabis effects in the, fall, in the domains that you could see up there. And they evaluated the evidence as being on one extreme, it says either conclusive, like this is, this is actual, actionable evidence, to insufficient evidence or an absence of evidence at the other extreme. Now what I found most striking about the review that the National Academies conducted is that there was conclusive evidence only available for some therapeutic effects, but not for negative health effects. There was conclusive evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for treatment of chronic pain as anti-emetics in the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting and for improving patient-reported multiple sclerosis spasticity. There was also substantial evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and a variety of negative health outcomes. But before we look at that, um, I think it is important to remember that when we talk about statistical association or correlation, it's not the same as causation, mm -hmm. as this uh, next study title <laughs> might illustrate. <laughs> That's not fair to my colleagues on the <laughs> stage here, but they'll see it later. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, the National Academies reported substantial evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and the following conditions. Worse respiratory outcomes or symptoms and more frequent chronic bronchitis episodes from smoking. Increased risk of motor vehicle crashes. Lower birth weight of offspring in cases of maternal cannabis smoking. Development of schizophrenia or other psychoses with the highest risk amongst the most frequent users. But it should be noted that other research, uh, by some of you may be familiar with the work of uh, Carl Hart, has looked at research on psychosis and questioned whether cannabis actually acts as a ca causal mechanism, finding that early and heavy use of cannabis is more likely in folks who have some sort of pre-existing vulnerability to psychosis, that the cannabis itself is not necessarily causing it. Research also shows, research also shows stimulant treatment of ADHD during adolescence is not a risk factor for the development of problem cannabis use. Being male and smoking cigarettes are risk factors for the progression of cannabis use to problem cannabis use. And finally, initiating cannabis use at a younger age is a risk factor for development of problem cannabis use. Thankfully, the National Academies of Science has also provided some guidance, some recommendations for where we need to go with cannabis research. We obviously need to, to address research gaps. 
We need to improve the quality of research. We need to improve the capacity of states to gather good data. And we need to address the research barriers. Now, on that note, part of the problem in conducting good cannabis research is that that examines both therapeutic and negative health effects is that the primary funder of cannabis research in the world is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So it's an agency that equates really any use with abuse. And the other challenge, of course, is that the, the cannabis remains a Schedule I substance. So any clinical research requires the use of DEA authorized plant material produced by the federally contracted farm at the University, University of Mississippi. Now after a six year process, my uh, friend and colleague Dr. Sue Sisley obtained a DEA license to purchase Ole Miss cannabis for her experimental study of the therapeutic effects of cannabis for treating PTSD in veterans. This is ongoing research. This is Sue accepting her shipment from a bewildered FedEx driver. <laughs> she sent me these photos the other day. Now, as you can see, the quality of what was spent, sent to Dr. Sisley more closely resembles what you'd use to spice your spaghetti sauce than treat a mental health condition. So one of the big concerns is that federal prohibition restricts the capacity of cannabis researchers to conduct solid scientific studies. And on that note, I'd also point out that actually Prop 64 that voters approved in uh, uh, 2016 sets aside when the revenue is there, $10 million annually to public universities in the great state of California to conduct research. cannabis research. And so, of course, my institute is, is very interested in trying to collaborate with other Cal State campuses and the UCs to make that happen. But one of the consequences of this, this logjam, if you will, is that federally approved clinical research is not using real world cannabis, which of course raises serious questions about the validity and generalizability of the research that has been done looking at both public health, negative public health effects, as well as therapeutic effects. So I think I'll stop there. Um, if you have really good x-ray vision, these are my references, but I'd be happy to, uh, to send them to you at a later date. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you again to uh, each of our presenters, uh, both for the education and uh, the rich perspectives that each of you have offered. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I just want to say uh, just a few words about the question and answer period. So we have plenty of time. We actually have an hour for question and discussion. So um, two things. Uh, we have no cards that were passed out. So I'm going to ask uh, my student volunteers who are still here if yeah, if you would just, if you can pass those to the side of the aisles. Let's actually say pass it to this side, to the, yeah, my right <laughs> over here. And they will collect those from you and they'll bring them to me. I'll sort through them and use some of those for, for questions as a mailback for them. Um, second, if you uh, would like to ask a question out loud, which would be fantastic, we have a microphone here and a microphone here. I just ask that you go ahead and line up, um, ask your question, and then you can cycle out. Um, when you ask a question, given that we're all part of a community here, I just ask that you please introduce yourself, say who you are, um, and if you can, um, just be brief, given we have a full room and we probably have many questions that people want to ask. Those are really the only two factors. Um, and so with that, I see we have a few people lined up already. So how about we start on this side of the room over here, and I'll alternate sides. So. Okay, well, first I'd like to... Um, let Mr. Horn know that the expected revenues, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, can you please introduce yourself too? Or just say who you are? My name is David Abbasi with the Central Valley Cannabis Association. Um, I had some things I wanted to mention to Mr. Dirk. Um, the revenues that they're expecting from any of these measures, mm -hmm. uh, they're really based on pipe dreams. They're expecting these high market values 
uh, on the cannabis product itself to come up with this, these millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen in other cities and counties that they haven't really realized the tax benefit, as you mentioned, I believe, because uh, sometimes overtaxation uh, will cause them to go back to the streets, back to the black market. Um, there is, in fact, discretion in Measure J. Measure J has some lethal language in it, and it says that the county can adopt density impact restrictions, limits and restrictions, and other uh, distance limits that uh, is essentially going to give them the ability to have one per district, meaning only five potentially dispensaries in the entire county. One of the supervisors was pushing for a six dispensary deal. Uh, essentially, that gives him the ability to, to do that. So there is some dis, uh, disinformation that I wanted to clear up in regards to some of these measures. We see Measure J and Measure K both as special interest monopolies based on the language. Measure K only has two cannabis zones where the authors have already purchased the property in those two areas. <laughs> so we see this type of thing happening across the state. Unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of public corruption sometimes involved as well because we are talking about limited permits and a lot of money here. Um, that language with the temporary lawful medicinal cannabis dispensary is again discretionary. What makes you temporary lawful? It's all based on a list that the, the County Board of Supervisors uh, determines. Um, Anna, I wanted to also mention a few things. Um, with the opioid crisis, cannabis has been shown in states that have legalized to have reduced uh, the opioid use and over overdose deaths in those states that have legalized cannabis. Uh, overall teen use in Colorado was particularly down, uh, and people do use it to treat anxiety and depression as well. And one last thing, there was a National Institute of Health study which did some prenatal uh, pr uh, study on Jamaican women who had used heavily uh, and given birth. What they found is that the quality of alertness, um, irritability, uh, and various other factors were actually higher scores for those um, infants between ages one month and three months. Um, so that was just something I thought was interesting. And Professor Mizell, um, cannabis, hemp, hemp can, in fact, impact climate change. If we were to use hemp and, and mass produce it, it could be revolutionizing the industries of uh, many different industries and having a, 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 a beneficial impact on the environment. And of course, there is medicinal value study in um, Spain has shown that uh, the cancer, anti-cancer benefits of cannabinoids uh, is real. So our position here regarding the three measures, after analyzing all three, we say yes on measure O because it is fair, it is inclusive, um, it, it, is, it is something that we think would be uh, open and, and more people would be able to apply. Measures J and K, we say no on J and K, we think we can do better. In fact, we just qualified our own ballot measure for Kern County. It will be on the ballot in March 2020. It is a fair and sensible set of regulations. And uh, it's more like, it's more in line with the environmental impact report that they did. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to ask you, if, if, you if, like, if this is the last point. And, then and, I'll, and the last the question I have, I, I guess the only question I have, <laughs> I haven't really asked yeah. a question yet. Thank you, yeah. Is, um, do you think Kern County deserves better that we can wait or we can work with uh, the Board of Supervisors to come up with something more? Okay. Uh, you owned or previously owned medical marijuana dispensaries in Kern County, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure we're above board on where you're coming from. And that's no issue. You're entitled to make a living, right? Tax revenue is projected, right? That's all we can do until we have some years to, to model it on. And you are correct that other states, they had this pie in the sky projection of how much money they're going to make via taxes. And then that wasn't the case. And, and in Colorado and Washington, uh, legislatures even offered to lower the tax rates on many of the, the recreational marijuana. Um, there's a, just a a report out by the Rand Corporation that uh, says that the price of marijuana in legal markets will go down eventually, right? But when eventually is, who knows? That you have to let the market do your work. So you are correct there. Uh, with Measure J and the five dispensaries per one per district, that may be so. That just reiterates my point that these laws are very ambiguous. They're written by industry people, right? And the fact that you're going to have a proposition in 2020 goes further to my point of the, the county has advocated its responsibility. If the county took responsibility and wrote fair regulations, right, fair regulations, we wouldn't be addressing this thing every two elections, right? We've been addressing this in Kern County for a long, long time. That's you right. are correct. You have proper grievances, but 
that goes to the point where the county is advocating its position and we're letting special interests fight among themselves to see which one will be influenced more, right? That's kind of the point. Well, I'll tell you, with our measure, we did a lot of research mm -hmm. and we did polling. Uh, we had open meetings. And what we came up with was a smaller, more uh, conservative oh. measure with a lower tax to prevent black market revival. Okay. Uh, and it does all the things and then more than what these others do. Okay. Thank you very much for your Thank comments, you. sir. I appreciate it. Any, any other responses before we move on to the next question? I, would, I, I just want to share an observation. I, uh, I've become quite concerned about the emergence of what people are calling Big Canna. Um, and the, the conversation about developing regulations and licensing by default always kind of refers back to, well, what's been the experience with alcohol and tobacco? Well, that's kind of scary. You know, if we think about the influence of tobacco specifically, and it shifted, thankfully, you know, to one that really focuses on public health. Uh, and so w what, I'm, what I'm getting at is when we talk about for example, a cannabis advisory board in the state of California with 22 seats, and I think six or seven of them have indi industry represented representation, you know, they, they don't necessarily write policy, but they re make recommendations. I was at a meeting in Quebec, Canada in August, uh, a, a cannabis meeting, and what I learned there is, you know, they have a very different political system. People can't get, write a, a, an open-ended check to a Justin Trudeau to get legalization. Well, maybe he recognized that that would get him elected. But the, the point simply being that um, I think special interests are a concern. Oh, yeah. And you know, do, special, do corporate big can of interests, do they, are they prioritizing public health? And um, History says yeah. they prioritize profit. Well, <laughs> yeah. Especially when there are shareholders, you know, for Tilray and Canopy Growth and all these other uh, publicly traded ca companies. So, yeah. Sir, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. But I'm going to poach a little bit, too. Um, That's fine. I just ask you to keep it brief so we can. I understand. Okay. And if you don't mind, actually, just introducing yourself. And if, of you, course. if you're directing to someone, just let us know. Had Thank planned you. to do that. I was Thank just you. answering questions at this point. Thank you. First of all, uh, I wanted to uh, express my appreciation for the for the Kegley Institu uh, Institute to uh, have this. Uh, Charles Kegley was a, a, a great man. I knew him. I was a second entering class at Cal State Bakersfield. And I was one of those people uh, that was made an instant sophomore quite by mistake. They missed my text, test scores up with somebody else, some bright person. <laughs> but uh, I, I also, my name is Phil Ganong. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't uh, announce who I was. Uh, I am the author of Measure O. I am the author of Measure J. And I decided to come today and hear what, what you all said. And by and large, uh, it was pretty accurate. Um, I will say that, that Measure a, uh, O and J were both drafted uh, to encourage free enterprise and an open application process. And if you look at it, the only nod there was in Measure J was to the legal non-conforming pre-existing uh, entities that were being forced to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to stay in business for a few months and to amortize and recoup their so-called investment, only to be told by the county that they were going to get six months more. So it's very correct that the county and the city have enmity towards this industry, towards the drug. And my address to the uh, lady from Kern Mental Health, uh, there's been no reported lethal dose of cannabis. In fact, uh, Judge Younger for the DEA, an administrative law judge, found in 1968 that in order to in, to uh, smoke a lethal dose of cannabis, one would have to smoke 1,500 pounds of cannabis in 15 minutes. Can't be done. Uh, you may feel like you're going to die. You may be uncomfortable if you ingest the wrong stuff, but you're not going to die. Uh, now, my question is this. Uh, starting with the assumption that the black market is fueled by um, the bottlenecks that are created by cities and counties that refuse to make decisions based on evidence as opposed to based upon their stomach and shop-worn, moss-backed,
conservative principles that came out of the Mississippi and Alabama era in the 1930s, and Mr. Anslinger, who was, you know, the, the narcotics czar to replace alcohol, which had just been made legal. Do you believe that the BCC, the CDFA, BCC controls the permitting for dispensaries for retail, uh, CDFA controls ag and cultivation, and the Department of Health Services, got a different name, controls essentially the manufacturing for ingestion and for concentrates. If they basically said, we're going to do a moratorium on the cities and the counties being able to ban this, and we're going to say, if you want to be in the business, we will issue you a permit. And for four years, you can come in and you can sell and establish and bring this entire industry that's never been legal, unlike the alcohol business, which had been at one time, lift that entire industry up, get it into the arms of the community, register them, identify them, regulate them, and let the community see that reefer madness is no more real in Bakersfield or Kern County today than it was in 1932. And let them normalize their relationship. And then go back and say, if you want to now ban this medicinally, and I'm just speaking about medicinally because Kern County and Bakersfield is not grown up enough to be able to handle recreational. But if we just say, do it medicinally, do you think that might work? That's my question. Thank you. You want to go first? Since it's all joke. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to mention that um, during my presentation I was very cautious not to use the term overdose uh, because that's been um, associated with opioids and the risk of um, death via overdose on opioids, not cannabis. I talked specifically about poisoning um, and, and you quoted me being feeling uncomfortable due to a high um, level of ingestion. That's all. Um, as far as uh, how you approach the regulation and and giving gentle nudges to lo local localities, right? Um, we just mentioned Canada just legalized marijuana, and they have, they have learned from some of the mistakes that U.S. states have made. Um, they allow provinces, which are equivalent to their states, to not uh, have storefront marijuana dispensaries, but what they do include is that those people living in those provinces have to be allowed to purchase marijuana from the federal government online, and it has to be able to be delivered. So that's the type of law that allows uh, provinces that have laws that curtail to their individual type of culture while still providing providing access to individual citizens under the greater national law. So the, we have a lot of issues in California. We're going to have a lot of issues for a couple of years. Like uh, Mr. Ganong said, it's a brand new industry. With a new industry, there's a lot of uh, figuring out of how we go, of how we talk about things, and uh, much of the data that a Anna was talking about, we need more of it because we, we don't have enough long-term studies to see how marijuana actually impacts children and DUIs and, and things of that nature, right? So there are examples from around the world uh, just recently, right, of how we can make it better, right? So uh, the system we have now is not working, right? Is the system of having the state coming down and saying that these localities have to do that? Is that the answer? I don't know. But the answer is not to stay with the, the status quo that we have now. Thank you. Um, go over here. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Amy Pakla. I'm a student here at CSUB, and I've also been a medical marijuana patient for about 20 years now. I, I use it to treat um, bipolar disorder, anxiety. Uh, I have a slight tremor from other uh, legitimate medications I've been given for these disorders, and it treats that. Um, I moved to California because it would be legal for me to take the only medicine I found that works. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this comes off uh, the last thing that was said up here. Um, we don't have the long-term studies. We don't have the research. We don't have the, I think, are there any, does, do, have any of you heard, do any of you know about any plans in the works to start thinking of medical marijuana patients as, instead of criminals or addicts, to think of us as patients on long-term maintenance medications, just like you do someone who's on glucotrol mm -hmm. or, or Wellbutrin mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is that, you know, blood thinners for heart, mm -hmm. those sorts of medications. It, with that approach, I think it would be easier to get the kind of information that we really need to make the smart decisions about our different kinds of political options and who's gonna run stuff and what we're gonna call, what we're gonna call good. 
So I was wondering, um, have you heard anything about that? What do you think a structure for doing something like that would work? And how would you, how would you get that message out um, to the medical community to, to think of, you know, when you hear, I do drugs from a patient, instead of constantly, you know, immediately flipping over to that, oh, you need help, you're in trouble, maybe, okay, what is that doing for you? How do you feel about that? What are the, what are the effects you're feeling? And, and start to generate some of that research that we need. Um, I'd also like to say thank you very much for making a space for me as a patient to talk about this and for coming and presenting your views uh, to our school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I could, I could speak briefly to that. I think part of your question or is, is about what does normalization look like? Um, you know, because I, th I think what we're hearing is concern about stigmatization, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, language is important. It was a huge shift in 96 when we talked about people as patients, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to users, and they're taking their medicine rather than a drug. You know, there, the, there, uh, some people argue that all, you know, cannabis use is about wellness. You know, that's one perspective. You know, so I, I, I think that, that that question about where we are in terms of the, a movement, if we are in that, going in that direction towards normalization, is important. Some people question whether we are in this sort of uh, post-prohibition moment. People used to talk about, you know, we're in a post-racial society when Obama was elected. We knew that was a you know, crock. But, uh, you know, so are we in a post-prohibition moment? Well, not really. I mean, if you live in Mississippi, yeah, there's a farm down, you know, at the University of Mississippi, but you better not be caught with cannabis. Flip side is just about every state does have some provision to actually provide medicine, medical cannabis, in very, very specific circumstances, even in the, in the Deep South. Um, there is an interest in creating capacity for, and this is what I think I was hearing you, you ask about, for, for patients, for users to be a part of studies, to be, to be able to provide data. Uh, Dr. Sue Sisley, whose, whose work I mentioned, she's involved in developing a, a patient registry uh, where information could be tracked about people's experiences. And, and I also wanna just say it's interesting to hear you talk about your, your own individual experience with cannabis. Um, and, you know, it's the hard thing here is that for any sort of policy making or decision, certainly by a doctor, we need evidence. But obviously for an individual user, people make their own decisions. You know, we make decisions about alcohol consumption, and it affects people differently, and we make decisions about chocolate consumption, or whatever your vice may be. But the point is, is when, the, and I say this, you know, to, to aunties and uncles and grandparents or whoever, thinks that I might know because I have a doctor before my name even though I'm a sociologist that I might have some insight on as to what they should take for a particular condition I just say well and maybe this isn't okay to say but I said well it's not going to kill you you could try it <laughs> I mean it's true you know I mean edibles aside you know edibles really will make you feel like you've died if you take too much. <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what people tell me in the research I've done. <laughs> people yeah, tell me. Too. No. <laughs> I always do that to myself. Um, no, the, the, the point being that uh, pe people who I have interviewed, I just completed some research in the spring. We interviewed about 50 people about their ba bad experiences, not overdoses, but bad mm -hmm. trips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and they talk about dying. You know, yeah. They think they've died. They're dead. And, uh, you know, like that, well, I can go on and on. I, I'll stop. As there. far as uh, barriers to longitudinal research and be able to have some more insight, the federal government was, is a yeah. big barrier to that. He, he was talking about earlier the process of getting the marijuana that is allowed to experiment on and how that's just low-grade junk is what you know is what they would say uh, so the federal government is a, is a barrier though but there's there's conversations and it's bipartisan believe it or not in this in this day and age we have Republican senators from Colorado that have teamed up with senators from California that are trying to finesse the Trump administration into allowing more medical research into allowing some R&D so full legalization at the federal level might not be on its way but 
insight into uh, research and other uh, developments are around the corner, I believe. So what I'll uh, talk a little bit about is in terms of um, stigma and how people are seen in a number of different treatment settings. Um, and you talked about um, people being treated as individuals. So in our business, um, stigma is one of the things that we battle constantly. Um, and its language becomes really important in terms of how people refer to one another, how treaters refer to the people they work with. So um, a lot of the work around reducing that stigma is in collaborating with physicians to, like you mentioned, not necessarily assume that because somebody um, discloses that they are using a substance, that automatically that means that they are engaged in a life of crime, they're no good, you know, um, they leave all the responsibilities behind, not at all. And actually one of the things that is mandated in terms of primary care is um, it, it's this um, intervention called ESPERT. ESPERT starts for screening, um, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And ESPERT is based on exactly that. You ask ask whether somebody, or physicians ask whether somebody has used a substance, um, um, ask a little bit more about the frequency, and then have a conversation about how that is risky. Um, that's common in terms of alcohol, but it could be the same way in terms of other substances. And so what you mentioned in terms of um, treaters asking individuals, what does that do to you, or how does that work for you? Um, that's one of the evidence-based practices that we use in our programs, motivational interviewing. Um, and motivational interviewing, interviewing is a way of just speaking with people. And it's based on the fact that um, if you ask the right questions, people already know the answers. It's very much human nature that if I say, don't do this, you will do this. Or you will say, I, you can't tell me what to do, right? So we find that in drug treatment, um, or, or in physical health care too, when the nutritionist tells me, you know, you really need to lose some weight, I say, lady, uh, I got to go, you know? So same thing with um, drug and alcohol um, use. When somebody is asked um, and is being listened to with an open kind of receptive and caring, welcoming attitude, they're a lot more likely to speak honestly about the use that they're engaging in. And if somebody asks with concern and with care and curiosity, um, those answers will arise. And just the way that those questions are answers can lead to behavior change, not pushed by a doctor, not initiated by, the, by a doctor, but by the individual themselves. So that's one of the things that um, in our programs we push our staff to do. Um, now, you know, stigma is alive and well everywhere. Um, so it's a constant um, struggle and a constant effort on our part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Sergeant Melton, obviously I can't use in the near future, but doesn't mean I can't be a part of the process. Um, I have a question for each one of the um, panel. Uh, Professor Horn, you said potentially $30 million in profits for Kern County with the taxation. Does that take into effect the inmates that are currently incarcerated um, that would be released because uh, obviously that costs money each day to house them the food everything that goes with that does that 30 million potentially uh, I know that that number is up for debate but does that include that and then ma'am um, the other thing I was looking at is you said the rate of minors obtaining cannabis has increased uh, how much has that increased since it's been legalized? Because I know that you spoke about it since it's been legalized, that mm -hmm. yes, that those incidents has occurred. I mean, I'm sure this is the same with alcohol and everything, but do we have numbers that shows before it was legalized compared to after it was legalized, those minors that were able to obtain um, uh, cannabis? And sir, for you, as far as like the VA, the VA is obviously federally funded. I'm part of that. Uh, I'm disabled myself. How do we overcome those barriers to be able to get the quality, the quantity, everything you need, if it's CBD, oils, whatever it may be, how do we overcome that so that we could properly test for the veterans? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question and thank you for your service. Um, the numbers that have been calculated by the planning department do not include factors, uh, ancillary factors such as um, 
prisoners released from county jail or any other uh, law enforcement saving methods like that. It it's estimating tax revenue, right? And whether that is accurate or not is up for debate, but that's not being calculated in the amount of money that uh, will be generated from, from uh, recreational or medical marijuana. Um, also, we get to save a little bit of money because the state is funding a lot of these regulatory uh, measures through the, um, the Cannabis Bureau. Uh, there, That's included in a lot of the tax revenue that's generated to the state is the state is giving localities money in order to help them push to embrace uh, marijuana uh, reg uh, regulation rather than ban it. So no, that number does not include uh, uh, savings from law enforcement or savings from jailing uh, inmates. It just includes tax revenue. Um, so in terms of the data that I have here with me, it, comparing the increase in use um, for youth prior to legalization and after comes from uh, the reports from the Rocky Mountain High Impact Drug Trafficking Area um, studies and between 2014 and 2017 updates. And what I have states, between pre-commercialization and post-commercialization -com of medical marijuana, there was a 24% increase in youth, ages 12 to 17, monthly marijuana use. Um, and there was an 8% increase just one year after legalization of recreation marijuana in 2013. And the other piece of information I have is that in Washington State, 65% um, of the seizures of marijuana in 2015 were from youth ages 12 to 17, as compared to 30% in 2010, prior to legalization. Can I address, can I respond to that? Sure. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's interesting, there's a report that came out in 16 from the Colorado Department of Public Safety that, that it does not show such a, a change, and and it, I, I, what, I guess I guess the big question I'd have, and I and I'll have to go back and look at the report that you're referencing. But you know, I think authorship is important. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rocky Mountain drug high intensity drug trafficking operation. I mean, you know, the, they certainly have an axe to grind, um, and I'd I'd question I think what what the data is, what they're looking at. Um, I mean, that's all I can say. I'm not mm -hmm. saying necessarily that it's accurate or inaccurate. It's just that it's not consistent with another uh, Colorado State Agency report. Also, there's the, you know, the question about impairment uh, and, dra and traffic fatalities. As many of you know, you know, cannabis remains in the system for a month. So when we talk about traffic fatalities associated with cannabis, is it impairment or somebody has, has it in their system mm -hmm. and they're in an accident? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then what does impairment even mean? What if you're medical and you need cannabis to function? And impairment actually makes you able to drive. I asked that question of the head of CHP in California and they weren't really sure what to do with that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something important to think about. Um, and then a, a, another related piece is around youth cannabis use and alcohol. To what extent might we be seeing actually nationally uh, downward trends in alcohol consumption among youth where there is overall a slight increase in cannabis use? Uh, young people talk about uh, crossfading. You know, can cannabis and alcohol don't mix together so well. There's a lot of knowing laughter in the crowd right now. <laughs> and that being said, that being said, to what extent might you know, that may be, you know, if, if we're looking at, you know, two vices, two drugs, and young people are going to use them, may, maybe it's, I, I mean, maybe it, you know, one is lesser of the two. In response to, to the question you asked about the VA, um, I, I, I can assure you my colleague, Dr. Sue Sisley, has, has been working very, uh, very hard with veterans and trying to impact the VA, you know, on a number of fronts. One, it just at a basic level, um, allowing for veterans to have access with their veterans benefits to medical cannabis in states where it's legal. There's been a big, uh, you know, I think that's been a big roadblock. Um, I, I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, but I think pressure is important. Contacting, you know, representatives and, you know, if, if people feel that that's something that they need to have access to, to treat a you know particular condition, then they should be applying the pressure, you know where it's going to matter. So. I'm a little bit short. 
Can I like lower this? Hello, my name is Dina Shari. First off, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for coming out tonight. I feel like I gained a lot of useful information that I didn't know before. Um, I think this is going to be more of like an opinionated question in a <laughs> sense, but uh, it's really directed to Mrs. Oliveira. Um, I saw on your solution side that you said slide you said that the key to prevention is education. Well, from you know statistics in Europe, we could see that you know legal drinking is more apparent and from younger ages as well. So I just believe that kids, no matter what, are gonna wanna smoke pot. Like, it's always gonna be an apparent issue. So instead of just turning a blind eye to the situation, can we actively work to push for legalization, but also educate the uses, like side effects and dangers that come with it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And Yes, I'd like to hear your opinion. <laughs> sure. Um, so in terms of, um, I think education is key. Uh, like you've heard um, the rest of the panelists say, research um, is mixed. So it's difficult to know what kind of information to access. So in terms of what can be done, one of the things I've learned previously from experiences in Colorado is that they've engaged in a really big media campaign to educate um, everybody that is there. So everywhere you go, there's billboards, um, and there's commercials, and there's YouTube spots that talk about, yes, this is legal, uh, but remember, this can interfere, this can get in the way of, and then they list several things. In terms of engaging youth um, with, the, with the right approach and the right information, the way that um, this campaign in Colorado is presented is by talking about what cannabis could get in the way of. So if, um, and it presents it in a very matter of fact way. The, the spots talk about, well, do you, if you start using marijuana, how could that get in the way of your driving? What can happen to your license? Um, what can happen to your grades? What can happen to prom? So it really prompts young people and parents to have a conversation um, about what consequences they will decide on based on their parenting styles and the way that um, norms they have within their family. Um, and I, I really think that's the key. I'm not here to um, tell parents how to parent. Um, I, have, uh, I have my ways of parenting. Um, but also in, in our department, we work with individuals whose children have been removed from their care uh, because of drug and alcohol use. And one of the things we talk about um, in terms of people reuniting with their children and keeping their families intact is just to consider what, um, how present are they um, while parenting, possibly under the influence of um, a substance or being impaired by um, a medication or that kind of thing. Parenting is an active um, activity. It's uh, really taxing. It takes a, an emo emotional toll. And um, everybody has their own way of doing it. Uh, now, that's not to say that people who, um, who use cannabis or who use alcohol or who have to take medications for whatever condition aren't able to parent either. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to dip into our mailbag here uh, question. So how do, and this is for the, for the panel, whoever would like to, to answer, how do federal banking regulations affect the cannabis industry? And is it true that this is a cash only business? And doesn't that uh, potentially lead to crime? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it right, is a primarily cash only business. Uh, the federal government has guidelines about taking money from uh, illegal substances and marijuana is still illegal substance on the federal level. There's even a, a, a recent reports about uh, some candidates for office, I believe back east uh, in a legal state who had taken uh, do campaign donations from marijuana mm -hmm. businesses and she had to return those campaign donations because the banks would not take them. The federal government uh, threatened her with legal action.
action. So marijuana money it does not like to be touched by the federal government, does not like to be touched by the big banks who often rely on a lot of uh, benefits from the, ta uh, from the federal government. California has floated the idea of creating a, a marijuana bank, uh, but that's since faltered out of pressure from the federal government and just a lack of who's going to control the bank. Uh, there are some dispensaries that take some form of, of uh, credit or ATM, right? The legality of that is unknown, um, but mostly those dispensaries are connected to the, the big canna, like you've been mentioning. Uh, they have uh, banking accounts in Canada and things like that. So there are dispensaries, but the overwhelming majority of them are cash only, which attracts lots of lots of crime, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of crime. Uh, so that's an issue that could be easily solved that has nothing to do with uh, ambiguous data or uh, county uh, regulation. That could be easily done with the swipe of a pin at the federal level. That's what Paul Goldstein calls systemic violence, that it's a system of cannabis, you know, drug, uh, you know, drug distribution that creates the conditions under which it becomes really attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a cash-only economy. Um, the federal government's happy to take cannabis money, though, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. but they don't allow cannabis businesses to take the expenses that, you know, a frozen mm -hmm. yogurt shop can take or yep. whatever it may be. So that's, and that's one of the dynamics here in terms of thinking about why recreational or medical cannabis is so much more than what, priced so much more than what you could find yes. on, the, uh, on the black market. Just to give you a glimpse of the place where I, I'm from, when my eldest was about three, three years old, he found a $100 bill uh, walking home from preschool. And um, when he was in middle school, he, he and his, his buddy were walking through town and they found a wad of $100 bills in a rubber band. It doesn't happen too often. I mean, you know, he wasn't dealing in preschool or anything. He found <laughs> it. He found it. $100 bills rolled up, 500 bucks. Just boom, like that. That's, you know, it's, it's, a, cash, it's a cash economy. And so when you have a cash economy, you have targets. Yeah. Hello, my name is Heather Epps. Um, I and Jeff Jarvis, I believe he's around here, we are the proponents of Measure O and Measure J. Um, find me on Facebook if you guys need any information. I just want to clarify, uh, and Laurel I spoke at a planning meeting, our setbacks are 1,000 feet across the board on both measures. State, 600, we have a little, uh, a little further. We have been <laughs> criticized numerously over uh, where our tax revenue was going to go. Um, if you guys remember in 2016, the library tax, it was a specific tax to uh, the libraries to keep them open. Well, it passed with 50%, but because it didn't get two thirds of the vote, it didn't pass. So back in those days, the laws changed since then. So we didn't have that ability to say, this is going to go towards law enforcement. It's gonna go to the general fund, same as the 1% that we're all going to vote on. Um, and then my next, <laughs> oh, the sales tax. It's a 7.5% business tax to the businesses, not the patients. So you guys won't be paying sales tax on under Measure O and Measure J. And the studies kill me. Um, when I was a kid, I would never have admitted that I smoked marijuana. Would you? I mean, you guys are a lot younger than me. I'm 40. But, you know, that it's really hard statistically to say, one, who is allowing the federal government to study cannabis on their kids? And two, what's to say they weren't drinking alcohol, just like we spoke mm -hmm. about earlier? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just not fair. And we saw the quality of the cannabis the feds are getting. Wow, that was a great slide. But anyways, thank you so much. Heather Epps, Jeff Jarvis, thank you. <laughs> It's actually quite good that you didn't allocate specific money to uh, specific issues. Uh, other states that have allocated, well, you know, 50% needs to go to education and 20% needs to go to et cetera, they have found that when states do that, this, the revenue that would have traditionally been put into those sectors, into the they general. dry up. So the state stops funding education, mm -hmm. stops funding law enforcement. So policy experts, they agree that you should do a general fund yeah. to allow discretion, right? Uh, and the tax, you are correct, it's on, it's on business. And the business tax. But and you said it, but it's, you said, yeah, you know, but, it's kind of tricky with people when they hear But as we know from, yeah. you know, if we put a tax on oil, we put a tax exactly. on, that's coming down to us, right? Yeah. Eventually coming down to us. But exactly. yeah, you're right. All but right. Good job on, no, on the general fund. <laughs> um, sir, you have a question? 
Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan uh, Burkett, and I'm a, I'm a student here at uh, Cal State. I have a 3.43 GPA. Three months ago, I actually had a, a heart surgery. I uh, also suffer from some mental disability that I was taking Seroquel for since about 1995. Right on the bottle of Seroquel, it states that it will cause heart problems. Mm. But I obeyed my doctors and I took my Seroquel. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the years, uh, you know, I have smoked uh, marijuana and that seems to help. And uh, the, what I hear is like, it's a schizophrenia, I guess. It's a committee of these little voices in the back of my head mm -hmm. that just makes it amazingly challenging to study and things. Mm -hmm. And yet I do very well in class and I work hard and uh, with the challenges that I have, the marijuana really has helped, you know. And actually, it's kind of funny. I went out and bought one of these hats the other day. I've never had one of these my whole life, but <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I grew up in San Clemente, California, and uh, over the years, for seven years, I wanted to get clean from other substances and dealing with these voices, and I, I had uh, got into recovery, and uh, I actually just, just uh, you know, started smoking a little bit of pot and noticed that that really helps. Once I got off the Seroquel and all of the prescribed legal psych drugs that were really hurting me, Zyprexa, Risperdal. They tried all this different stuff just trying to make this little committee go away. And yet I used a tiny bit of marijuana and it goes away. So it's really great. Thank you very much for letting me tell my story. Thank you, sir. So I actually I want to ask one of the mailbag questions, and then I'll, I'll get to your question, sir. Um, this is actually was touched on briefly, but uh, I think it, it connects with um, uh, the last question and, and story that was just shared. How uh, has medical marijuana been used thus far to treat PTSD in veterans? Um, and is there any strong evidence for therapeutic benefits? Well, um, the... Uh the FDA ordered a uh, fast track of a review of uh, PTSD side, uh, effects with marijuana, specifically for veterans, right? So there's an indication there that they think there might be some benefits, right? Uh, we haven't had any longitudinal studies that I'm aware of, but there's indication from the government itself that they're willing. They're also looking into microdosing of psilocybin mushrooms to treat PS, uh, PTSD. Uh, they're, they're looking for a lot of... MDMA as well. Uh, they're looking for a lot of alternative medicines because the, what the current track of treatment is not helping a lot of individuals. So uh, again, we need more research on this issue, but I think that the indications by the federal government shows that there's probably something there. Yeah, and I, would, I guess I would encourage whoever asked that question or the, you as general audience to look up Sue Sisley, S-I-S-L-E-Y, and her, her research. I mean, she, she's a doctor. I mean, uh, she was a practitioner, or is a practitioner in Arizona, and she was seeing that a lot of her patients who were veterans um, dealing with PTSD, and they were reporting anecdotally that cannabis was providing better relief for them than the prescription drugs that the VA was giving. And so she embarked on this journey to get DA approval to conduct the research. She's also gotten involved with, um, uh, it's, a, it's a basically an NFL players association that supports um, NFL players' uh, right, they mm -hmm. argue it's a right to be able to use cannabis to treat uh, chronic pain from football related injuries, but also uh, concussions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, lots of, lots of areas where there, there clearly needs to be more research. Yeah. If I could just um, make a comment um, about the story that was recently shared in terms of psychiatric medications. Um, so what was mentioned is, is actually true, and I just want to make that clear, that um, mental illness is um, a challenging um, field. Um, it's treated with medications that are available, FDA approved, but again, they, they have risks. So as he indicated, the, the label does say that it may cause heart problems. And so that's why it's really, really important for every individual 
individual to talk to their healthcare provider to tailor those interventions. Um, in terms of psychiatric medications, it's sometimes challenging to find the right combination that will address the particular symptoms at any one time. So um, much like other chronic illnesses, um, mental illness is the same. So it has to be managed um, over a long period of time. Um, there are things that uh, treaters recommend to increase overall wellness, um, and that involves um, through psych or psychological kind of interventions, you know, um, work practicing different coping skills, looking at ways to alter our thinking patterns to help our mood, um, but also basic things that um, we do if we want to stay healthy, like uh, sleep regularly, uh, drink a lot of water, eat your vegetables, exercise, all those kinds of things. So the fact that um, that psychiatric treatment, um, I, I don't want to leave without saying that it doesn't, it's not the end all be all by any means. And again, I just want to emphasize um, addressing individual treatment with your own healthcare provider. Thank you. Hello, aloha guests. Uh, welcome to Cal State. My name is Paul Hudgens. Uh, I'm a third year nursing student. Uh, here on campus, and uh, I'm also a uh, Army veteran, so I see the, the benefits and also possible uh, adverse effects of marijuana use uh, in this community. So this year, I'm studying uh, community health, and community health is different from the other nursing classes that I've taken, and that we, instead of looking at individual patients uh, as one person in one unit, we look at the entire the entire community as and a patient. Mm -hmm. So my question is specifically for Ms. Oliveira because she's a clinician, but I'm also uh, open to hearing what uh, your other perspective is. Um, my question is, as a behavioral health provider and an administrator, a leader, can you advise and share your opinion on what the proper role of behavioral health and community health providers ought to be to enhance and facilitate the therapeutic effects or mitigate the perceived adverse effects of cannabis legalization in the community. Okay, that's a lot, <laughs> but I'll try my best. <laughs> you so could, You could give us just one, one for each. Okay, I'll try. Um, I'll probably ask you to repeat the question in a second. <laughs> but, uh, but you're right, in terms of looking at treating one individual, um, it's a lot more costly and it's a lot more difficult. Um, and that's why in, in the beginning of my presentation, I talked about how pre uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Because prevention, um, it's, it's a more uh, cost-effective way to address problems in communities. So in terms of behavioral health, one of the things that um, I have the privilege of doing in my work is not just helping people individually as part of our treatment programs, but working with our community to help the community establish safer environments for its residents. Um, so in terms of our substance abuse prevention work, there's a large body of evidence in terms of prevention science uh, as to what works. We also, our department has mandates from the state because of federal block grants that we receive from SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at the federal level, and they require us to engage in um, uh, it's called strategic prevention framework. And that is uh, basically a roadmap that guides us as to how to engage communities um, so that the, the community members themselves um, organize themselves, collect data, and decide on appropriate interventions at a much upstream level of intervention. So working with an individual person, I can impact that one person. If I work with the family, I can make an impact with the family. But if we work at the community level, we have the opportunity to um, affect the environment in a way that the risks are reduced um, in the long term. One of the challenges with prevention science is that it takes a long time to see effects and prevention is like air. It's, it's everywhere around us. So some of the work that we've done in terms of reducing this risk in the communities have to do with just placement, um, like retail environments. So there's certain liquor stores that have little tiny bottles of alcohol right by the register, right by the door. So what the community was complaining about is that people would come in and steal them. Um, so they were losing out on profits. So that was our way to engage them into 
um, conversations and shifts in their just how they set up their store so that they can um, reduce that, that crime and lose those profits. Uh, but also in terms of our looking at the environment and how that affects youth, we, it would benefit the fact that youth did, had less um, access to this alcohol. And again, that turns into um, less risk for them in the future, um, better health outcomes in general. In terms of um, the benefits of um, cannabis, um, I can't. I cannot answer that because so I. Qu my question was, for that part was, <clears throat> how can health providers enhance, support, or facilitate the perceived therapeutic effects of marijuana use? Enhance the perceived. You know, I don't. I don't feel comfortable answering that. Um, only because, as our um, uh, the panel has mentioned, the research is mixed, um, and so the only thing I can say is to um, emphasize health and wellness. And because we know that some of the data that I quoted in terms of um, pregnant women and that kind of thing, the recommendations that I was talking about come from the um, American Academy of Pediatrics and the American um, Society of Obstetricians, um, which are associations that um, I feel confident in the recommendations that they make. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And sir, you have the honor of our last question tonight, so. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac Sosa, and my question is for, uh, uh, pr I don't know if you're a professor, but Professor Mizell. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to know if there's any merit to the, like, because you mentioned that there's two sides, like there's the, the side that thinks it's poison and the side mm -hmm. that thinks there's gonna, that it's gonna fix the world. So I want to know if there's any merit to the side that thinks it's going to fix the world. Because yeah. there's a, uh, I've like watched some documentaries about yeah. how before hemp was used to make like mm -hmm. ships, paper. Oh, sure. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Henry Ford, he made a car right. in like the 1920s mm -hmm. made of all hemp mm -hmm. and it ran on hemp oil. Yeah. So like when thinking about like rainforest being depleted and like wars going on for oil, would hemp be able to save the world? <laughs> 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 oh yes. No. No. I I mean, you know, I, I, that that statement about you know my concern with this kind of like it as the I mean it's a, the panacea to all of our ills and all of our concerns and all of our problems. It's also it's also contributed a lot. I mean, what's missing from this conversation, but has been very much a part of the the conversation up in my part of the world is the environmental, negative environmental impacts yeah. of illicit cannabis cultivation. Yeah. Now, to be clear, there's nothing inherent in cannabis cultivation that requires that you poach bears or that you release diesel fuel into streams or you know, destroy watersheds or what, yeah, whatever it may, yeah. You know, there's nothing implicit in the process. But um, there is an, there's a, there's a carbon footprint if we're talking indoor, there's, there is a lot of water use, and yes. this is in Humboldt County. You guys don't have a lot of water here. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so where does that come from? I mean, I understand there's a lot of other agriculture that already exists in the area, but in terms of will it reverse you know, climate change? Mm -hmm. Man, I hope something does. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. The direction we're going in, but will it be hemp? That's why nobody asked me about this. That's why I talk about cannabis. I don't use the language marijuana. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that, but I think cannabis is more inclusive mm -hmm. to think about the psychoactive and hemp. I think there's real value in, in, in considering both. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I, I'm not, I haven't gone down that road. There is, there are provisions now for, uh, you know, in the farm bill, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what year, for uh, universities to, or states mm -hmm. that will allow it for um, for hemp to be produced for research purposes and for other purposes as well. Yes. Um, yeah, so there, that, 
I mean, I think it's something we need to look at. Much of the CBD that's consumed that you could yeah. just buy legally, that comes okay. from hemp. And if this is a bipartisan issue, Mitch McConnell, the Senate uh, leader for the Republicans, he is the one that insisted that that be put into the farm bill yeah. to allow states to grow hemp because he wants to convert uh, Kentucky tobacco growers into mm -hmm. to hemp farmers uh, for long-term benefits and everything else. But hemp, I don't think it can hurt, right? Like there's very low THC in it. Like if any, uh, people aren't smoking that stuff, you'll give you a headache, right? I don't think, I don't think it'll hurt if, if the U.S. embraces hemp usage that way. So I want to say just thank you again, everybody, for, for joining us and being with us tonight, and we'll thank our panelists. <laughs> and have a wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs>